is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate for the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate or encourage any illegal activity and advise all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws by visiting normal.org, N-O-R-M-L dot org. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers of Normal Show Live are their own and do not necessarily reflect the philosophy and policies of Normal. Listener discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. From the promise of legalization. Uh, and I think we need to rethink and decriminalize our marijuana laws. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws presents... Normal Show Live, Marijuana Nation. Now, here's your host, Normal's Outreach Coordinator, Radical Russ Belvin. Oh yeah, good day, tokers and tokets. Welcome, it is Tuesday, April 10th, 2012, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Thanks for joining us here for the show. We have ourselves a good time, got all our friends streaming into the studio. Ganja John has made it to the Pirate's Desk. How you doing, Andrew John? Russ, how you doing? I'm doing uh, great. Yeah? I'm doing fantastic. Good it's day a today. Tuesday, except for the sh- crappy traffic and morning. <laughs> There's that. <laughs> we had a conference call with uh, Normal today talking about the uh, forthcoming uh, Normal National Conference, and uh, we broached the topic of, the, uh, of, of doing some benefit stuff. Excellent. So we'll talk more about that offline, but uh, I'm real excited. So yeah. we've also got Todd here for uh, Todd's Toker Topics. How you doing, Todd? Oh, I got to get your mic. Wrong oh, mic. Hot, 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 hot. Mic, hot, mic, mic, mic. <laughs> Not too bad. So what is our toker topic for today? We're going to discuss our family's version of camaraderie. Oh, camaraderie. Very nice. E-hugs. All right. Also joining us from our virtual studio in Grastoria, Oregon, is our senior news editor, Cannabis Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Oh, I have to call her first, though. It would help if I had her on the line. And I had the people in the chat room telling me to do so, and I was distracted. So uh, we'll get Carrie on the line here. Yeah, there you go. There we go. I hear her. (laughs) Carrie's got the hemp headlines right after the first break. What's in the news, Carrie? Uh, Well, today we're going to go to Florida. We've got some more uh, news on Governor Rick Scott down there. He's decided to use his veto power. We're going to tell you what he used it on. Also, we have an update on that little town in Spain that wanted to grow weed for Barcelona. And we've got some movement on a New York uh, medical marijuana bill. It hasn't quite been introduced, but Governor Cuomo out there already has some words about it. I'm going to tell you what those are. All right. I'm also going to bring a couple of stories in from the blog. One is a settlement in uh, Wisconsin for a teenage boy who was strip searched over a baggie of weed. And we got some celebrity news. Snoop Dogg and Jim Belushi, two separate stories, but uh, stories about Snoop Dogg and Jim Belushi to bring to you at the end of the news. On today's show, it's also Electric Tuesday, and that means we bring you the best of the electronic dance music or experimental music. And, And today it's experimental music. We've got a new release from the Symphony of Science. You can find these guys at symphonyofscience.com. This one's about the dinosaurs, the world of the dinosaurs. So we'll look forward to that video coming up here at 20 After. Then at half past, we are part of a blog tour that is introducing the brand new official High Times Cannabis Cookbook. Author Elise McDonough will be on with us at half past and we'll be going over the recipe that we shared on our blog at stash.normal.org. And then at the end of the show, time for a radical rant on Oregon's changing patient numbers and the effect it is had. Back after this. You're listening to Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. Hi, I'm Radical Russ. One of the best things about marijuana is the wonderful aroma. But when you travel a lot like I do, that aroma becomes a suspicious smell. That's why I endorse Stealth-Products.com, the leaders in smell-proof containers. From smell-proof vacuum bags to smell-proof backpacks and duffel bags, all the way to smell-proof digital safes, Stealth-Products.com has you covered. Stealth-Products.com brings you safe, secure, odorless layers of protection with activated carbon fiber. 
Backpacks and duffel bags are simple black so as not to attract attention with a logo or flashy design. Now, nothing is perfectly odor controlled from the detection of drug dogs, but with proper vigilance, containers from stealth-products.com will help you avoid nosy humans. You're now listening to Ella Beats. Stealth-products.com. Stealth-products.com. Hey, what up? It's the Dirt Ball from the Cottonmouth Kings. You are now listening to the normal show live. Weedmaps.com. I'm Radical Russ from Normal. In my job as outreach coordinator, I travel every month, and when I'm on the road, I need a fast, accurate way to find the medical marijuana dispensaries in the area. So I turn to Weedmaps.com. Weedmaps.com has the best dispensary locator online or on your mobile device. Search by zip code or let Weedmaps find you, and in seconds, you'll have the addresses, phone numbers, and customer service reviews for the medical marijuana dispensaries in the local area. Weedmaps.com also has a section devoted to helping you find a doctor who understands and recommends medical marijuana under your state's law. You can even check prices on the Medical Marijuana Stock Exchange. Coming soon, you'll even be able to find the listings of normal attorneys and chapters, local head shops and grow shops, and the best weed-friendly businesses. Weedmaps.com has the information you need to be an informed cannabis consumer. Visit Weedmaps.com today, a proud sponsor of the Normal Network. Medical marijuana, industrial hemp, consumer cannabis. It's time for this week's Normal News with Cannabis Carry. A new push to legalize medical marijuana in New York has gathered steam in recent weeks, but today Governor Mario Cuomo said that although the idea has been kicked around Albany for years, uh, that because of the tremendous risk, it would not likely be taken up by the legislature this year. Staten Island State Senator Diane Savino is the lead sponsor of a medical marijuana bill that has been expected to be submitted to the legislature any day. But Governor Cuomo expressed doubt that there would be enough time for the legislature to address the measure properly before its session ends in June. The governor made the comments while speaking in upstate Utica, where he was asked about medical marijuana in the state of New York. He also said, quote, I understand the benefits, but there are also risks, and I think the risks outweigh the benefits at this point. A statement that was familiar to statements he made about medical marijuana during his 2010 campaign for governor. He also said that he would reevaluate his stance when there was more research on the matter and then added that his state currently has a terrible problem with drug use and the issue would take a great deal of time to analyze it properly. Senator Savino had said that hers is really a two-year strategy to introduce medical marijuana in New York. She said that this first bill would hopefully lay the groundwork needed within the legislature to get a more favorable bill favorable bill next session with more lawmakers on board. Those close to the campaign to write a medical marijuana bill in New York said that as they go into 2013, they want to stress both the medical benefits, but also the economic benefits that would be gained by allowing a regulated system for medical marijuana. But in 2012, we still need to get to this year's bill. They say that they are putting the finishing touches on it. And when it is introduced, we will let you know if it gets that all important date with the committee. Well, Governor Cuomo, what is this danger you're worried about? What is this terrible danger that would happen if New York were to go the same route as 16 other states and recognize the medical use of marijuana? I mean, I heard some talk about there about New York having a terrible drug problem, but we're not talking about drugs. We're not talking about medical heroin or medical meth or medical cocaine. In fact, the last two out of three of those that I mentioned are actually medically prescribable drugs. We're not talking about that, though. We're talking about not arresting and imprisoning and harassing people who are very sick, who've gotten a doctor's recommendation to use marijuana for medicinal purposes. So what is this terrible danger that you're so worried about? Is it that some people who aren't really sick might smoke pot? Well, guess what, Governor Cuomo? That's happening already. That's already happening. And it doesn't stop them from smoking pot that it's illegal right now, and it won't change them from smoking pot if you make medical marijuana legal. What you will do is protect the sick and most vulnerable people who are using marijuana who are stopped by this prohibition, who won't use this medicine because they could get busted for it. You're not going to do anything to affect those of us who are healthy and just like to smoke pot, but you could do a lot to help the people who really need uh, medical marijuana uh, in, their, in their lives. And Florida Governor Rick Scott used his veto powers on Friday to veto a bill that would have sent nonviolent drug addicts 
to treatment after serving half of their sentence. House Bill 177, called the Inmate Reentry Bill, would have the courts screening eligible drug offenders and select them for the program based on a list of other considerations. They would be required to attend and graduate from drug treatment and counseling programs. The program would also include enrollment in adult education courses for those offenders without a high school diploma and even vocational skills education in some instances. And of course, all of that if the offender behaves during his first half of the drug sentence. The bill was very popular in both houses. It passed the House with a 40 to 0 vote and it sailed through the Senate with a 112 to 4 vote. Both Florida houses have reputations for being tough on crime and criminals. But Governor Scott, it seems, is even tougher. And he said he used his veto powers in this case because it was a public safety issue. Uh, Scott gave a veto statement that began with, quote, justice to victims of crimes is not served when a criminal is permitted to be released early from a sentence imposed by the courts, unquote. He went on to say that it would interfere with a law passed earlier by the Get Tough on Crime lawmakers in the Sunshine State that said inmates must serve 85% of their imposed sentences. The bill's sponsor, Senator Ellen Boganoff, a Republican from Fort Lauderdale, says that Governor Scott is missing the point when he calls it a public safety issue. The prison sentence would have chosen the inmates based on good behavior and the likelihood that a rehabilitation program would save taxpayer money. Oh, uh, well, you know, this 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 Governor Scott, you know, there, I, there's not enough bad things I could say about the guy. But uh, let's start with this. Vetoing this bill, uh, you know, would be so something that'd be so obviously helpful and such a small step to take forward compared to what really needs to happen in the state of Florida. Uh, you know, we just are not going to make any headway uh, in that legislature or getting past uh, that governor's desk until we make a change in that position. Uh, it's just a, it's just a shame that the state of Florida is going to continue to waste money, continue to ruin lives uh, when something like this, some sensible solution like this comes along and, and you, you just have a governor, just one person who stands in the way of progress. I sure hope the vote of Florida can do something about that sometime soon. And some world cannabis news updates on a story we brought to you earlier this year. The small town of Rascara, located in Catalonia, Spain, has a plan to bring that little town out of debt. A cannabis club in the nearby city of Barcelona had approached the town's leaders about a place to grow cannabis for their 5,000 member club. They wanted to lease about 70 acres of land owned by the town that has been traditionally known for growing olives, almonds, and raising sheep. The mayor thought it was a great idea and told a residents that came to a town hall meeting in early January that it was a chance to bring jobs and money to the cash-strapped village. Rascara has a population of about 960. Now, while some members of the community liked the idea, some did not, and the worldwide media attention didn't help those that were against the idea to change their minds. A second cannabis club from Barcelona was also in talks with the town to lease additional land to grow cannabis and to farm cannabis seeds. If the plan took off, the tiny little Viscara town would be the largest single supplier of cannabis in Europe. The Barcelona Personal Use Cannabis Club wanted to pay the town $860,000 a year for the right to grow their cannabis. And uh, they would also be looking to fill about 40 jobs on the cannabis farm that they said would also be used to grow some organic vegetables. The town agreed to set up a committee to drop protocols on security and risk control. Now, at first, the seven-member town council headed by the mayor said yes to at least that first cannabis club. But amid the growing controversy, he then decided that he would put the plan on a referendum so the town's residents could vote on the matter. A referendum would need 75 percent of the voters to say yes for it to pass. They voted earlier today, and although the idea to lease the town's empty pastures to some big city cannabis growers passed by a majority, they didn't get the 75 percent they were seeking. The vote went uh, for 308 saying yes to 239 saying no. That's a 56 to 44 percent split. The payment from the cannabis club would have equaled the, the debt of the town. Spain's economy crashed after a real estate bubble, and many small towns are struggling to cope with debt. Spain has a current unemployment rate of 23 percent and almost 50 percent for young workers. Mayor Bernard Polisa said he thought the idea was a good solution to help the local economy and asked for those that had a better idea to please come forward. Now, some voters may have changed their minds on what a good idea it was when the officials with the government's national drug plan issued a statement before the vote saying that growing large amounts of marijuana would be against Spanish law and vowed to block any attempts at mass cultivation. Now, in Spain, consumption and cultivation of cannabis in small amounts and in private is allowed by law, but growing it for sale in any amount, advertising it, and selling it remain illegal. Mayor Polisa insisted that the initiative was legal since the club had agreed 
that the marijuana grown in Rascara would have been for private consumption by its members who collectively pay to grow it. Sounds familiar. Polisa went as far as pledging to resign if the referendum failed, but uh, since the vote today, we have no word from the mayor. Well, here we have have a town that's just looking at the only growth industry they can find, you know, trying to find a way to pay the bills and, and willing to jump through all sorts of hoops and willing to, you know, pay their uh, respective tithes to the government, whatever it might be, to get, for protection money, however you want to frame it. And once again, these great ideas are stymied by this web of international drug control policy that is the legacy of the United States. It's the legacy of Harry J. Anslinger. This guy served as our federal uh, drug czar, if you want to call him that, from the founding of Prohibition from 1937 to 1962. This one guy was in charge of our drug policy for 25 years and ramrodded this uh, 1961 single convention UN treaty uh, through the United Nations that has pretty much forced places like Spain, you know, all the countries of the world that have signed onto this treaty to have to oppose these kind of large scale grows in small Spanish towns. They have to under the threat of international law and treaties. Uh, it's, it, this is so uh, insipid, this, this web that we're all tied into, and we've got to take it apart town by town, city by city, state by state, country by country, but it's going to have to start somewhere. And I'm glad to see that these fine people in the small Spanish town have decided to start doing it their way. All right, Carrie, thanks for the news there. We have some other news stories I wanted to bring up. You know, we've uh, brought you stories of strip searching of young teenagers, of, of school children uh, in this fight on the war on drugs. And oftentimes when we're talking about this, these stories, it's uh, a, it's a uh, uh, drug test or it's a strip search that happens in a police office, the strip search that happens in a principal's office or in a school. Well, this story I have for you, an update that was uh, passed on to me by uh, Alan St. Pierre, our executive director, uh, a case from Wisconsin where a 16-year-old boy was strip searched on the out in public. On the road. Let me let me read this to you. The city of Beloit, Wisconsin, has just settled a lawsuit out of court that was brought by this 16-year-old boy. Now, he was in a parked car with two other boys when police received a call reporting drug activity. Right? They're probably hotboxing, right? Whatever. When the officer uh, responded, he showed up to the, the situation, had him get out of the car, and he was questioning the 16-year-old boy and doing the, the standard pat-down frisk when he noticed a bulge in the teen's pants. And, of course, the officer asked, what's that bulge in your pants? And the teen responded, my cock. <laughs> Actually, the news report says he responded that it was his genitalia, but I imagine he probably said something along those lines. The cop didn't believe him and kept pressuring the boy, so the boy dropped his pants right there on the side of the road. And that's when the cop grabbed the kid and pushed him so roughly up against the back of that car that it broke the back windshield of the car and the kid suffered a concussion. And then after that, the 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 cop searches through the kid's underwear that are down around his, his uh, feet and finds a small baggie containing a personal use amount of marijuana in that teenage kid's underwear. Well, of course, this kid sued, a 16-year-old sued the city of Beloit, Wisconsin, and the city has just paid a settlement out of court for $265,000 to settle that suit. So uh, uh, just let it, let it be known there that uh, if you're driving through Wisconsin, that is just not right, just not right to force teenagers to take their pants off for the strip search. Ganja John's bringing up something on the screen there. Is it the... I, I actually have a sound clip for us, if you can turn me oh, on. Oh, yeah, let me get here. you up there. Let's see if we can do this. This is from... <laughs> That's your penis. Sorry about that. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> That's your penis. Well, for that, this boy has been has won a two hundred and sixty five thousand dollar lawsuit. That has to make it the most expensive baggie of marijuana in history. Also, in quick news story, Snoop Dogg is now selling a book of his songs called Rolling Words, a smokable songbook. The entire songbook is made of hemp and hemp paper. It is a rollable and has a match strike cover on the spine so you can light Snoop Dogg's words in your joint. 
And in other celebrity news, uh, ABC News is reporting that Jim Belushi, the uh, actor, was caught with a joint of weed at Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. He produced his medical marijuana card, which doesn't work in Massachusetts, and was dismissed. Time for a break. I know. We got to hunt down Jim Belushi and get get him to smoke out with us, man. (laughs) I'll see you all in a minute. It's 20 after the hour, and we have to take a short break, if you know what I mean. Please support these sponsors who support Normal Show Live. Oh, have you ever met that funny repo man? A repo man. Have you ever met that funny repo man? A repo man. If he said he swam to China, he would send you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that repo man. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the only way to honor the Constitution that recognizes our natural rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak to my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at www.omarfigueroa.com. This is Normal Show Live. Georgia. Hi, this is Willie Nelson, and I need your help. Alcohol prohibition didn't work in the 20s, and marijuana prohibition isn't working today. It's time we stop arresting law-abiding citizens because they prefer marijuana over alcohol. Nearly 2,000 Americans are arrested every day on marijuana charges. We're unfairly destroying the lives and careers of hundreds of thousands of people each year simply because they smoke marijuana. These are not criminals, they're average citizens like you, good neighbors who work hard, raise families, pay taxes, and contribute to their communities. We need your help to end marijuana prohibition once and for all. It's the fair thing to do. For more information, contact Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Call toll-free 888-67-NORML or visit their website at norml.org. It's time for your daily toker tunes, the best in 420-friendly music from all genres that uplifts, entertains, and informs the public. Today we bring you tunes for Electric Tuesday, our segment featuring the best of modern electric music in the genres of dance, new age, house, and experimental. If you'd like to submit your song to be played on Normal Show Live, send it to us at stash at normal.org. Now here's some more great independent marijuana music for today's Daily Toker Tunes. Welcome back, folks, and uh, we love on these Electric Tuesdays to premiere the latest videos that come out of this website called symphonyofscience.com. It really goes back to Carl Sagan, the uh, famous... The, the, the famous mathematician and uh, cosmologist who had that series Cosmos on television back when I was a kid and that really popularized science and astronomy for my generation, essentially. And uh, the person who put this uh, symphony of science together has been, he started with uh, Carl Sagan videos and some Stephen Hawking and just basically used auto-tune to try to get some of his most important scientific and philosophical concepts uh, through to the lay audience. And I found it to be extremely enjoyable and and uh, a lot of the folks that listen to the show really enjoy these. So whenever they pull up a new, uh, whenever they bring up a new video, we love to premiere it here on the show. They're up to video, I believe this is their 14th or 15th video from Symphony of Science. You can download all of them from their website at symphonyofscience.com. This one is entitled The World of the Dinosaurs. So enjoy. How do you start to get close to animals that lived hundreds of millions of years ago? 
Symphony of Science, symphonyofscience.com. Download the videos today. Have you ever wondered how to make the best tasting and most potent pop brownies possible? Do you consistently seek out recipes that will elevate your marijuana-infused cuisine to the highest levels imaginable? Then it's time to pick up a copy of the official High Times Cannabis Cookbook, published by the world's most trusted name when it comes to getting stoned. Packed tight with more than 50 recipes for iry appetizers, munchy meals, high holidays, stoner sweets, and cannabis cocktails, along with expert advice that demystifies the experience of infusing marijuana into butter, alcohol, and various oils. This book will get you cooking with grass in no time, with special treats inspired by Willie Nelson, Snoop Dogg, and Cheech and Chong, plus all the info you need to stay safe when making and consuming edibles. You will truly learn how to bake a ganja cake and eat it too. So look for the official High Times Cannabis Cookbook wherever finer books. Catch Normal News with Cannabis Carry every weekday on Normal Show Live at 7 p.m. Eastern here on the Normal Network. It's Wiz Coleco from the Ivy Island Hour, which comes to you live every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Pacific on the Normal Network. I just wanted to let you know that two of my favorite bands are teaming up to spread good vibes across the land and are headed to a venue near you. Revolution is heading out on the second leg of their tour in support of the release of their new triple album, Peace of Mind, which includes full-length acoustic and dub versions. They'll also be joined by our boys from the land of Aloha, The Green. We're also promoting the recent release of their latest album, Ways and Means. You can check out a full list of shows, get the latest swag, and most importantly, find their music at revolutionmusic.com and thegreen808.com. 
Don't miss this amazing tour. I promise you, after these shows, you'll have peace of mind. The most devastating effect of the war on marijuana is that it is a war on everyday people like you and me. All week, we speak to the doctors, scientists, celebrities, and politicians who make up the professionals fighting for cannabis liberty. But we never forget about the tens of millions who use cannabis, the millions who need medical access to cannabis, and the hundreds of thousands arrested every year for cannabis, and the tens of thousands imprisoned under our marijuana laws. At Normal, we are the Cannabis Consumers Lobby, and we take this opportunity to share the experience of our cannabis community. All right, welcome back, everyone. And uh, as you saw from the video earlier on the show, there is now an official High Times Cannabis Cookbook. And joining us here as part of her week-long blog tour to promote it is the author, Elise McDonough. How you doing, Elise? I'm doing great, Russ. How are you? I'm fantastic, and uh, I'm looking at the cover here, and folks on the webcam can see it right next to me here, of the High Times Cannabis Cookbook and what looks to be a piece of pumpkin pie. Now, you've got a recipe for, for ganja pumpkin pie? Yes, that is oh. our great ganja pumpkin pie, perfect oh. for lighting up your Halloween night. Yeah, I can't, I can't wait for that. That's one of my favorite things. So uh, all sorts of great stuff in this cookbook. Uh, tell people how much we're covering. I mean, do you have to have a basic understanding of already how to cook with cannabis to use this book, or does this go all the way to the beginner? This goes all the way to the beginner. It instructs you on the basic methods of infusing cannabis into the ingredients of butter or oil that you then add to a variety of recipes. So we made sure that there was definitely things in there for people who have never really cooked before. Simple recipes like the uh, stuffed jalapeno poppers or the uh, pico de ganja nachos mm. that are really easy to make for the beginning cook, as well as you know, some simple soups and salads. And so we wanted to also provide some, you know, recipes that would challenge uh, experienced home cooks as well. And that's where you see stuff like the pot and pancetta stuffed beef tenderloin oh. and some recipes that might call for a more experienced cook. You know, this is, is kind of like a, a, a self-propelled uh, engine or, or self-propelled cycle here. You, you get the great ganja foods, you eat them, and then you get the munchies and you got to get more ganja foods. This is a, what a racket you found here, Elise. <laughs> It does work like a breeder reactor. That's why we tell people if you're going to make a ganja-infused treat, you know, if you're making brownies or something, make a, make a ganja-infused tray and then make a normal tray, too, because yeah. you're going to get hungry and you're going to want some unmedicated food to munch on. Yeah, and that's what, you know, when most people think of cannabis cooking, the first thing they think of are brownies. You know, uh, pot brownies are, you know, long-time staple of, of uh, cannabis edibles. Uh, I assume you have, do you have a, a recipe in there for the classic pot brownie? Yeah, we have got classic cannabis brownies. It's a recipe that honors counterculture hero Brownie Mary. So we wanted to tell her story, and we did that and included a great recipe for brownies so that people can make them and remember that the great work that she did helping AIDS patients, mm -hmm. you know, with her med medical treats. Yeah, we've got a song that we play uh, on the network uh, about Brownie Mary all the time. I hope people like uh, learn more about her and her activism. Uh, we're speaking with Elise McDonough, the author of the official High Times Cannabis Cookbook, and one of our live listeners in the chat room would, li would like to know uh, if you're discussing decarboxylation in this book. Yes, we do cover all the uh, basic knowledge that you need about cannabis edibles in the introduction, and it explains how you need to convert your THC you know, from your fresh raw plant out of the ground has absolutely no psychoactive THC in it. You have to dry or heat your plant matter to have that chemical reaction occur, and THC acid transforms into psychoactive THC. So we cover all those steps thoroughly in the book. Fantastic, because people with just a, a passing knowledge of, of cannabis and may have heard of uh, Alice B. Toklas brownies might think that you're just, you know, throwing buds in and cooking it up, and it's not that way at all. There's a process here. Yes, you've seen more and more chefs really uh, take cannabis cuisine to a new height. And we're learning more now about the terpenoids and the flavonoids and a lot of interesting things in cannabis that they, you can then learn, you know, does my cannabis strain have a, a piney taste? Does it have a terpene in it that might m lend itself to pairing with other flavors and other foods? So we get into that in the book, too. It's really quite cutting edge with our uh, recipe for the Tom Young ganja 
we got into some uh, terpene-based flavor pairings. Hmm. All right. Well, this is the High Times, the official High Times Cannabis Cookbook. We've got a blog post on it at our blog at stash.normal.org. You can click the, the book to go straight to where you can order the book. And we have a recipe for folks up there. And, and I love the one that you've given us here, and I don't know if it was targeted at my dietary needs at all, but uh, it's a green leafy kale salad with brown can of butter vinaigrette. And this is a recipe from Bobby Helen. Tell us a little bit about the chef and a little bit about this recipe. Well, that re- the chef that gave us the green leafy kale salad, Bobby Helen, he is the chef at a, a restaurant in New York called Resto that's actually right next to the High Times office. So it's a favorite place for the staff to go for when we have a special lunch or something. And so we've become friends with Bobby, and they catered a really excellent High Times holiday party one time where they served this salad, and it was truly to die for. And we said we must add cannabis to the salad. It's excellent. Yeah, and, you know, I had never uh, heard of any sort of, like, a can of butter vinaigrette. I mean, I really like those uh, those uh, vinegar-type tastes, those sour kind of tastes. How does the can of butter work with that? Does it, does it change the vinaigrette taste in, in any way? Well, it's a basic brown butter vinaigrette. So you're, you're browning your butter so that you want it to have a nutty kind of flavor and aroma. And cannabis lends itself very well to that kind of preparation because the flavor of cannabis is in itself very earthy and nutty. Sure. So it's a great complement to that kind of vinaigrette. And, uh, you know, when I speak to folks about uh, cannabis edibles, one of the complaints that I'll hear back with them is they don't like it when it tastes like hay. They don't want to taste too much of that plant material. Uh, it, what kind of tips can you give cannabis cooks and what kind of tips do you have in the cookbook uh, regarding the taste of cannabis itself? Well, a lot of times the unpleasant taste that people encounter, that sort of grassy taste, yeah, you yeah, know, that. I know what you're talking about. That results from the breakdown of chlorophyll, and that can happen if you're using trim leaves that are fresh, and then the green material starts to break down and you get that kind of taste. So if you want to avoid that, you can use, you know, a higher quality ingredient, like a nice cured flour, or you could use a still nicer, you know, sifted keef or hash, which is really, you know, going to taste the best, but it is the most expensive kind of ingredient to use for cooking. Hmm. And, and when it comes to making, I, I understand that uh, a lot of this cannabis cooking, the, the base ingredient of it is this can of butter uh, that gets brought up so many times in, in the various recipes. Is there a guide in making this can of butter as far as how much cannabis to use to achieve <laughs> however much result you want, if you know what I mean? Yeah, we get into proper dosing and potency. Mm -hmm. You know, it's tough to be totally specific because it depends on the material that you're starting with. You know, Mm -hmm. some cannabis strains are much stronger than others. So you just have to kind of know what you're working with. If you're working with something, if you have lab results that say, you know, this is 25% THC versus this is 15% THC, you'll get a sense of should I use more buds or less. Mm -hmm. But we cover all that in the book. And we also include um, recipes not only for butter, but several different methods of making butter, whether you have a lot of time or a little bit of time, as well as how to infuse into oil, how to infuse into coconut oil, how to make a basic mayonnaise and other sorts of basic infusions. Mm. Elise McDonough uh, from High Times Cannabis Cookbook. She's the author. She's speaking to us live uh, via telephone. And Elise, one of the big uh, subjects now in the medical marijuana states, now that they you know, have access to, like you mentioned, labs and testing, is a lot of patients looking for CBD-rich uh, type of strains. D- does your book just stay mostly with the cooking aspects, or is there a discussion of the different ingredients, cannabis-wise, that you might be using with respect to strains or CBD-THC ratios? Oh, yes. In the introduction, we get into some of the different genetics, you know, indica versus sativa and what effects you can expect from each. We also touch upon the CBD, you know, the new situation that's going on right now where people have more choices than ever, Mm -hmm. you know, as far as their cannabis medicine goes. So we definitely touch upon all those things in the book. Oh, that's that's great news. And folks, if you want to get a copy of this book, it's out now, uh, the official High Times Cannabis Cookbook. You can just go to our blog at stash.normal.org. And while you're there, pick up the green leafy kale salad with brown can of butter recipe from Bobby Helen. And this is part uh, really uh, interesting uh, promotional 
uh, venue that you've come up with here, a blog tour where uh, today, of course, you're here with the stash. Tomorrow, you're uh, on Toke of the Town's blog with some ganja gumbo. Oh, boy. On Thursday, uh, how, how did I get the salad and Toke of the Town got the gumbo, man? <laughs> on Thursday, we've got green ganja smashed potatoes. And I'm from Idaho, Elise. How did I get, not get the mashed potatoes? Uh, smashed potatoes for the San Francisco Bay Guardian. And then on Friday, April 13th, Friday the 13th, pineapple express upside down cake on high times. I, I feel like I got to be the, uh, the, uh, the dinner and then everybody else got the desserts, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got the healthiest, most nourishing uh, dish. Like, you got to eat more kale, man. You got to get I more kale in you. I, I, I'm taking this as a message from above. <laughs> got to change my ways. <laughs> Oh, Elise, I'm so looking forward to this uh, this cookbook. It looks like you got a lot of other great recipes in here. And again, on this blog tour, when you're going out to you know tomorrow's Toke of the Town, Thursday, San Francisco Bay Guardian, Friday, High Times, each one of those recipes is going to be available, right? They can just copy those from the sites? Oh, absolutely. And then you can use it to make an entire menu for a ganja-infused feast if you want to make them all on one day. That would be perfect for 420. I was going to say, kale salad, ganja gumbo, smashed potatoes, and pineapple express upside-down cake. That's that's a full meal. <laughs> I don't know if you can, you'll, you'll be definitely. able to stand after it, but it's a full meal. <laughs> well, this is fantastic. You'll Elise. be satisfied. Is, is this your first foray into uh, uh, writing a book? Is this your first title published? I actually wrote a small book for Chelsea Green called uh, The Green Guide to Sustainable Food. That's all about why you should eat local and organic and what all the different you know, natural food labels mean. And oh, good. That was a really fun foray into publishing as well. And is there a, an eye to that in this cookbook with you know, responsible and local uh, uh, sourcing? We certainly encourage people to buy organic whenever they can, and we balance the recipes in the book to include plenty of healthy vegetarian options because we recognize that not everybody wants to eat a super buttery, heavy meal every single day. So oh, there's yeah. options for all lifestyles. Yeah, I tell you, Elise, I'm in Portland, Oregon, where if your menu doesn't include uh, vegan, vegetarian, uh, what's what's the other one? Quinoa. <laughs> Gluten-free. <laughs> yeah. Gluten-free. I mean, I didn't know there were so many different diets before I moved here. So I'm glad to hear that your cookbook is uh, taking a look at that. Again, folks, stash.normal.org. Check out the High Times Cannabis Cookbook. You can click on the book and go straight to where you can buy the book and Elise McDonough has been uh, joining us to talk about it Elise thanks so much for joining us here on Normal Show Live and good luck with the rest of the tour oh thanks Russ and uh, anything else you'd like to tell our listeners before we go I just, you know, like to let people know that I hope to see them in Denver for our Medical Cannabis Cup. It's coming up uh, 421 and 422. All right. We will be there as well, streaming live. I'll be in a couple of panels as well. And uh, we'll get to see you there. And uh, we'll talk to you again when we see you. All right. Have a great night. All right. Thanks so much, Elise. Elise McDonough, author of the High Times official cannabis cookbook. Check that out. We'll be back with Todd's Toker Topics right after this. Stick around. You're listening to Normal Show Live. The voice of the Marijuana Nation. Marijuana and alcohol are the two most popular recreational drugs in America. Marijuana smoking is non-toxic, relatively safe, and has a low risk of dependence. Alcohol drinking is potentially fatal, dangerous to society, and is quite addictive. Marijuana is safer, so why are we driving people to drink? That's the question of the new book, Marijuana is Safer, So Why Are We Driving People to Drink? by Paul Armentano, Mason Tvert, and Steve Fox. Visit Amazon.com or ChelseaGreen.com today to order your copy of Marijuana is Safer or visit MarijuanaIsSafer.com. Here at Normal Show Live, we spend all week taking a look at the tragedy of American marijuana prohibition. But it's important to take a break and remember that we are a vibrant, diverse, and oftentimes hilarious community of people. So our friend, comedian Todd Armstrong, joins us to poke fun at one of Todd's Toker topics. <laughs> All right. Well, I can see we're already promoting the show. We'll get to that at the end of the yeah. topic. 
But uh, Todd Armstrong is here with us again to lighten the mood with Todd's Toker Topics. What's our topic today? Uh, camaraderie. Camaraderie. Have at it, my man. Uh, more importantly, trust. Like, I wasn't wearing my hat, but I trust that the forum keeps asking for it, so I figure I put my hat on for everybody. Uh, but uh, I think the real issue that comes down to I think I figured out what makes us a family in the cannabis movement is our camaraderie. And basic that is trust, is that... No matter who you are in the cannabis movement, if somebody shoves something in front of your face, you put it in your mouth. That is <laughs> <Well> the <now. laughs> greatest level of trust I could ever imagine. I don't care if it's food or oil or, or anything. You trust people in this community to have your benefit in a good light. And the reason I don't think people, quote unquote, on the outside, being I'm going to wage the war of uh, smokers versus drinkers even, is that they're not used to someone in dr- trusting you if you walked up to a bar and a beautiful woman and said here i got you this drink trust me there's nothing in it (laughs) that doesn't happen just like drinkers the first time they they smoke they're often saying things like does this have pcp in it oh my god is this name just oh my god am i freaking out i can oh there's is it laced (laughs) potheads would never do that they realize that you know what no one's going to put something that probably costs 100 bucks a gram on top of something that costs 7 bucks a gram <laughs> and then give it to someone that they just smoked for the first time. Yeah. It's not like, I don't quite get that, but we don't have trust. And so you have people, once they first smoke pot, they go, hey, wait a minute. Why isn't this stuff legal? It's just a parallel. It's a different train track to alcohol. And the reason it comes down to is it's the trust and the camaraderie of the government is that people often realize that we are our government. We need to unite together and trust that we all have a family's vested interest. We all should trust the things that are put in front of us because we all put them in our mouth anyways. (laughs) We're like children. And so we need to explain to people that you don't need to trust your government because they don't have your best interest at heart because we are our own government, and we let children play unattended. That's why we have the Schedule 1, Schedule 2 issue is our camaraderie. We need to unite, unite together, just like Russ was talking about together, and come with our camaraderie and tell people that the Schedule 1, Schedule 2 issue is a genuine issue, that you can prescribe cocaine and methamphetamine, but you can't prescribe federally cannabis. We need to have our camaraderie come together and trust in one another that we need to focus on this, I think, because people need to understand outside of the culture of marijuana Pot is just a plant. It's not a drug. There would never be support of a culture of a drug. We have High Times Magazine because it's a plant. We don't have Meth Monthly because Crank's a drug. (laughs) Centerfolds would look beautiful in High Times Magazine for everyone to see. Lush, full, naked, nude woman. I'm not being sexist. It's a beautiful thing. Covered in naked female buds on their business districts. (laughs) And then imagine the business districts of the centerfolds in Meth Monthly. (laughs) That's not a town I'd walk through. And I don't imagine what would be covering up their business districts. It wouldn't be covers of beautiful pictures of plants. It'd probably be really awkwardly put together pipes and just scratch marks covering themselves. (laughs) And no one wants to see that because we need to trust in each other to do this because that is not a camaraderie of other drugs. No one hangs out and does heroin. No one hangs out and drinks too much in the daytime. That's kind of sad. But we need to hang out in the daytime. And please talk to your senators. You are congressmen. We need to get this dress on a federal issue and trust in everyone else to just focus. Everybody, go to the top of the pyramid, please. It's the number one thing we need to do. I'm Todd. Take it easy. <laughs> oh, yes, Todd. I deserved applause. I, I, there's a laughter and applause, <laughs> and that was fantastic. And you've got a, a, a fantastic little poster. Yeah, uh, oh, to yes. Promote. Let's uh, tell us all about that. Yes, I got my, uh, my DVD recording. Got to take care of that stuff, so. I'm actually doing a big, huge show. I'm kind of, kind of nervous and excited. Th- this show is to record the yeah, DVD for my DVD. I'm so, gonna do a so whole hour. So somebody could set. be laughing on, you know, it, yes, preserved forever. Absolutely. On a Todd Armstrong comedy DVD. That's right. All they have to be there is uh, Cinco de Mayo, May 5th at uh, 7.30 in Ridgefield, Washington. I suggest you're getting tickets uh, online. You can order them at oldlibertytheater.com. And last time, the last two shows were sold out. So, now, Are you there with other comedians? I'm going to have the fabulously awesome Anthony Lopez, probably the best new comic coming out of Portland, going to do uh, the hosting. And then my good friend Lonnie Brune, who's a great headliner. He's doing me a favor and uh, opening up for me a bit. And then it's going to be about an hour of me giving you about all my material. So I'm going to put it down and have some fun, and my family's going to be there. So you actually, if anybody wants to meet Cletus, he will actually be there. Oh, my goodness. If anyone to touch my brother's cauliflower ear, you can do it. Come to, come to Ridgeville. You know, what's one of my rules? Never mess with a man with a cauliflower oh, ear. that's right. No, 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 no. 
I do because he's my little brother and I'm faster than him. That's about it. <laughs> I, I really wish I could be there. I'll probably be in Dallas on the. No, uh, you'll have a tape of the DVD. So I I'm, can't I'm wait hoping to, to put it, it on iTunes and also my website you, in the next have month. A tape of it. Well, yeah, I'll have a tape a of the tape. <laughs> He's going to give you a VHS. A beta, a beta max. I, yeah, I probably still have a VHS player. I'm I that think old. you do. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Todd, and everybody Thank check you. that out. Again, where's the website for tickets or information? Uh, OldLibertyTheater.com or, of course, uh, Facebook backslash Goob the Knob. Goob the Knob on Facebook. Arm Todd Strong on Twitter. Thanks, yes. Todd, Thank once you again so much. for I took your topic. You want answers? I'm as bad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers. I want the truth. And you have offended Shaolin Temple. You can't handle the truth. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Hoorah! Hi, right right, folks. Welcome back. I uh, wanted to delve into some local politics here, state of Oregon stuff, because I got this news break published from the uh, AP, Associated Press, out of Grants Pass, Oregon. And uh, this was the title, Oregon has fewer big medical pot grows. Major medical marijuana growers are changing their ways in Oregon after federal agents raided selected monster grows to send the message that they can't serve as cover for selling on the black market. So uh, perusing through this article, I, there's a whole bunch of things that I just I, I wanted to address. And, and the first thing is that they, they do point out in the article that the number of registered patients is also down since the legislature doubled medical marijuana fees to $200. This is what happened in the state of Oregon. The uh, legislature, uh, there's all sorts of odious bills to restrict medical marijuana that didn't go anywhere, that had a lot of opposition to them, and they just could not restrict it like they wanted to. So at the last second, they went through a budgetary committee and kind of snuck something through in a budgetary committee to double the fees for medical marijuana in the state of Oregon. Now, not only did this double from $100 to $200, keep in mind that people, in order to get those medical marijuana cards in the first place, have to have had at least three doctor's visits that in within three years that show, that prove that they're really as sick as they say they are. And they usually can't get a recommendation from their doctor from those visits. So they have to go to another doctor at some specialty clinic and pay money for that. And then they double the fee on top of all that from $100 to $200. But for the people who are most at risk, the people who are most vulnerable, we're talking about not just sick, but also in poverty, talking about people who are on fixed incomes, veterans and people on disability, they, first of all, changed the requirement for how you could qualify for the low rate. Now, it used to be in the days when you could pay 100 bucks, the low rate was 20 bucks, right? And the way you could get on the low rate is if you were on SSI disability, or if you were on food stamps, or you were on the Oregon State Health Plan. So you could pay 20 bucks to get your medical marijuana card. Well now, not only have they raised the indigent fee, if you wanna call it that, to $100, an increase of five times for those people, right? 20 bucks to 100 bucks. Not only did they raise it to 100 bucks, but they removed the ability, the eligibility for Oregon Health Plan and for uh, the food stamp people. So only SSI people get that $100. For, so for some poor people who were on food stamps, some poor people who were on uh, the Oregon Health Plan, their fee went from 20 bucks to 200 bucks. That's what the legislature did here. And they did it uh, trying to say that, oh, well, there's these uh, medical marijuana is out of control. There's so many patients. Oh, my God, there's so much medical marijuana. F you know, they freak out about the so-called abuse, but their way of attacking it doesn't do anything to attack this so-called abuse. If you're allegedly growing medical marijuana to cover for your out-of-state dealing, if, if you suppose that's what you're doing, you're making enough money that increasing a card from 100 bucks to 200 bucks is no big deal for you. But if you really are that sick, disabled person on a fixed income with no way you know, of raising you know, 100 bucks, much less 200 bucks, those are the people that are impacted by this raise in fees. And what's so shameful about it is the raise in fees here in the state of Oregon was done precisely to do two things, reduce the number of patients and balance other budgets. That's right. The medical marijuana program in Oregon has been self-funded. In fact, it's run a surplus for years and years. And every now and then they steal the money out of that 
you know, they reapportion it to different uh, programs in the state. Well, this time they went and did that proactively. They didn't wait for the, the, the state to raise medical marijuana money. They went and doubled the fees with the purpose of raising that money to balance state budgets. So now what you're doing, now what you're doing is you're taking one segment of sick and disabled people who use a particular medicine that the federal government doesn't find popular, and you're overtaxing them because you're afraid of instituting a sales tax in this state, or you're afraid of raising property tax rates on some uh, constituency that's got the money and political connections to fight against this kind of thing. Now, in reviewing this story, they, they bring up some other statistics that are, are, are pretty amazing. First of all, oh, let me also mention that they instituted a grower fee. Here in the state of Oregon, if you're a disabled patient, and let's say, let's say you're you know, 70 and you're disabled and you can't grow pot for yourself and your wife's 68 and she can't really grow pot, but she's your caregiver, right? Well, in Oregon, there can be a third party. There can be a third person, a grower that you can designate who grows medical marijuana for you and supplies it to you. And, and for that person, you can reimburse them for their expenses. You can't reimburse them for labor, but you can reimburse them for expenses. Well, now the legislature added a $50 fee to register that grower. So now those growers, if, if indeed we want to presume there's some sort of abuse going on where people are trying to hide their illegal marijuana dealing under the cover of growing medical marijuana, if you want to presume that, now you've made it even more shady because now every patient who wants to register a grower, the grower can say, oh, no, I'll pay you that 50 bucks for you if you let me be your grower. I'll cover that 50 bucks for you. They'd be glad to if, if indeed you think that they're harvesting patients for their cards in order to protect their gardens. And I, regardless of the fact that I disagree with their entire premise that there's in, any sort of abuse going on in medical marijuana, even if you did agree with their premise, the actions they are taking do not address the problem that they suppose exists. And that's where I've got a big problem with this. The medical marijuana registry has dropped 5%. We had 58,000 patients in October. We now have 55,000 patients. Now, do you think that's because 3,000 people suddenly got well? <laughs> no. 3,000 people realized they couldn't afford to jump through the $200 or $250 hoop and have now gone back to risking arrest, risking the time and the resources the state or the local sheriff or cop is going to have to take to bust them risking jail time to treat their ailments. It all comes from them seeing 50,000 patients and thinking, oh my God, there's this terrible abuse. When really, if we found a medicine that works well for people with serious ailments, wouldn't more of them getting access to this medicine be seen as a good thing? 55,000 patients doesn't, doesn't throw me a bit when I realize that according to the Oregon State Cancer Database, there are 17,000 new incidences of, of uh, there are 17,000 new incidences of cancer in this state every year. 17,000. Yet we only have less than 1,000 cancer patients registered in the state of Oregon. If anything, medical marijuana isn't getting to enough people in the state of Oregon. Now, another thing that is noted in this, uh, another statistic noted in this uh, AP News is the decline in the big grow sites. Uh, they say the number of sites growing for one patient grew by 5% from 24,000 to 25,000. But the number of sites serving five or more patients dropped 26%. The number of sites serving 10 or more patients dropped 36%. And the sites growing for 15 or more patients dropped 55%. Now, they want to tout this as if this is a good thing, but let me tell you the little secret they're not telling you in this article. Under Oregon law, everybody, everybody who registers as a patient has to designate a grow site. So oftentimes what these one patient grow sites are, are just grow sites on paper only. They're GOPOs. Grow sites on paper only. These people aren't growing marijuana in their house. They are just required by law to list some address somewhere. So they list their own address. Meanwhile, the people who are the good growers, who want to grow these larger gardens to take care of more people, are punished by this situation where they can't help others out. Pro tip, make your grow house the address of your local sheriff. Lots of people doing that in Washington County. <laughs> So it's just ridiculous. And Lori Duckworth, our our uh, uh, our 
a chapter leader down there in Southern Oregon, she puts it just perfectly here, where she says what they're doing is they're just splitting up, relocating, and doing smaller gardens. And what it means is less legally grown pot for patients and more bought from the black market. It's exactly true. I can't understand why the state still does not want to regulate this to have some control over it, to license growers, to find ways to make this work, because it's not going anywhere. I'm Radical Russ for Ganja John and Cannabis Carry. Take care of each other, tokers. This is Normal Show Live, the voice of the marijuana nation. Stay tuned for Toker Talk Radio, Hour 2 coming up. I've got another rant prepared. That's right, two rants in one day. We're going to talk about drug testing and more on Toker Talk Radio. Stick around, tokers. You're listening to the Normal Network, where the time is 420, 24.